Welcome to our operating systems course. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about the motivation. So why do we actually need operating systems? What is an operating system after all? And we'll take a closer look at the history of operating systems and how they evolved over the last like 70 years. So as you already might know, my name is Michael Engel. Uh, I studied computer engineering and applied mathematics in Germany, got my PhD at Marburg University quite some time ago, and then spent some time at different universities and also in industry research in Germany and the United Kingdom. And now I'm associate professor for compiler design here at NTNU since January last year. So my research interests involve compilers and operating systems and especially how both interact the automatic parallelization of software, dependable computer systems, and also embedded systems. First, let's take a look at the literature we're going to use for this course. So we have two different books. Both are just used as background, so we're not following too strictly any of these books, but both provide sufficient material to understand what's going on in this course and to give you a bit more of background and references on the large topic of operating systems. So the first one is called Operating Systems, Three Easy Pieces by Arpasi Dusso. And this is a free PDF download from the author's website, which is really nice. The other one is a traditional textbook by Stallings, uh, which is called Operating Systems, Internals and Design Principles. And this is a book that exists for quite a long time. So it's currently in its ninth edition. So most of the errors should be found out and removed from that edition. However, we're also going to provide additional papers, articles, videos, whatever, and so on, on my webpage. So please use the URL in this slide to regularly look for more and interesting information. So what's the overview of today's lecture? First, we're going to take a look at the learning objectives for a course. So what do I expect you to know about? when the semester is over. Then we'll dig into operating systems and start with definitions of operating systems. We'll see that operating systems have quite a number of definitions which are not always identical. So we'll see what is common to these definitions. And after this, we'll start looking at the history, so the evolution of computers and along with that, the evolution of computer systems. So we start with very simple systems, so-called batch processing systems, and end up with the interactive computer use we know uh, and use today. And finally, we'll give an overview of what the topics of this semester in our course are. So let's start with the learning objectives. I want you to acquire basic knowledge about operating systems. So about their functionality, about their structure, about the algorithms used, and also about the implementation. And to take a look at the implementation, we'll give examples of implementation details in Linux or appropriate other operating systems uh, throughout the course. So there will be explicit lectures on implementation details, so how certain things are done in a modern commodity operating system. I also want you to have some first experience with what we call system programming. So programming on a level that is not using lots of libraries and abstractions like you might be well common, uh, commonly using with Java or Python, but really use the services that an operating system offers directly. And to do this, we are going to program in C and these exercises are running under a form of Unix that can be Linux, Mac OS X, or the Windows subsystem for Linux from Microsoft, which you can run under Windows 10. It doesn't really matter, so the systems are not 100% compatible, but the differences should be small enough, so you should be able to get the exercises running on any version of operating system you, th uh, you might be using. Additionally, I want you to understand what is going on inside a computer system. This is not a computer architecture lecture, obviously, but uh, still, as the operating system actually manages the resources of a computer system, it's really important to know the relation between what's going on in the system and how the operating system manages this and how the operating system also provides abstractions for resources of a computer system that it provides to processes. And finally, we're going to learn about some current trends and challenges for operating systems. 
at least some of the important ones. There are a large number of interesting things that have come up during the last couple of years. And of course, we are also going to talk about these here. So let's start with definitions. What is an operating system? I uh, started looking at the web and uh, at some common sources of information for definitions. So the first one is the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary. And the Merriam-Webster defines an operating system as software that controls the operation of a computer and directs the processing of programs as by assigning storage space in memory and controlling input and output functions. Well. That's very general and doesn't tell us a lot, but the first thing we know, operating systems are software, and this software controls the operation of a computer, and it also tells programs how they are processed. Another source on the web is encyclopedia.com. Encyclopedia.com has a bit more extensive definition, so it defines an operating system as the software that manages every part of a computer system all hardware and all other software. To be specific, it controls every file, every device, every section of main memory, every nanosecond of processing time, and every network connection. It controls who can use the system and how. In short, it is the boss. Without it, nothing can happen. So Encyclopedia uh, puts some emphasis on the fact that the operating system is in control of everything. So every little bit of a system and it also takes care of who is able to use these resources it provides. So essentially the computer uh, operating system sits between the computer hardware and all other pieces of software here. So let's take a look at what operating systems textbooks define. So the first one is Andy Tannenbaum in Modern Operating Systems. And here he gets a more, bit more specific. It is hard to pin down what an operating system is other than saying it's a software that runs in kernel mode. And even that is not always true. Part of the problem is that operating systems perform two basically unrelated functions. First one is providing application programmers and application programs a clean abstract set of resources instead of the messy hardware ones. And the second one is managing these hardware resources. Depending on who is doing the talking, you might hear mostly about one function or the other. So here we have two different views of what an operating system does, and it has to do both. So first, it has to provide clean abstracts of uh, resources. So it has to provide abstractions of what's provided by the hardware. So our computer gets easier to use from the point of view of programmers. And it also has to manage these resources. So these are a bit orthogonal and an operating system has to fulfill both roles. So essentially here we are already seeing a bit more of uh, the detail of the problems that operating system developers face when they have to work uh, on designing and developing systems. A definition from our textbook from Stallings uh, is uh, an OS is a program that controls the execution of application programs and acts as an interface between applications and the computer hardware. It can be thought of as having three objectives. First one is convenience. An operating system makes a computer more convenient to use. Second one is efficiency. So an operating system allows the computer system resources to be used in an efficient manner. And the third one is the ability to evolve. So an operating system should be constructed in such a way as to permit the effective development, testing, and introduction of new system functions without interfering with service. So Stallings actually focuses on what we call non-functional properties of a system. So convenience and efficiency. So an operating system can provide abstractions and can provide uh, the multiplexing of resources and administration of resources without being convenient or efficient. Of course, that's not what we want in an ideal operating system. We want it to be easy to use. We want it to not take up that many resources for itself. And the ability to evolve is really important, in, especially in today's environment, where we need to change the code of the operating system because we found security problems, so we need to fix them. Uh, 
or we have new sorts of applications or new hardware. So we want our applications that we develop to be available also on more modern hardware and to be able to exploit the yeah, functionality and performance that more modern hardware actually provides. Finally, we're take, uh, taking a look at the definition in Apposito Sos operating systems book. And they start off uh, by uh, turning the problem on its head. So they say there is a body of software, in fact, that's responsible for making it easy to run programs, even allowing you to seemingly run many at the same time, allowing programs to share memory, enabling programs to interact with devices, and other fun stuff like that. That body of software is called the operating system, as it is in charge of making sure the system operates correctly and efficiently in an easy to use manner. So this definition actually combines the Tannenbaum and the Stallings definition we've seen before. So it focuses on functional aspects like sharing memory, interacting with devices, and also on non-functional aspects like making sure the operating system operates efficiently and easy to use. So what can we learn from this? Essentially, we see that there are many definitions of the term operating systems, but there are a number of common ideas. And some of the common ideas are that the operating system serves the users and their programs. It's never an end to itself. So without applications and users, we would not need an operating system. As well, the operating system has to know the hardware in detail, and it has to provide abstractions which work for application programs, so which enable application programs to make efficient use of whatever hardware is provided by the underlying computer system. So hardware and application requirements determine the services provided by an operating system, and the structure and functionality of the system is derived from this. And to understand which hardware abstractions are provided today by an operating system, First, we'll take a look at the history of development of operating system, along with the advances in hardware and typical applications of computer systems. So the first computer systems that were using electric or electronic components were developed uh, sometime during the 1940s and then uh, with, to a larger extent beginning in the 1950s after World War II. But automatic data processing was introduced quite a bit earlier than that and the first part of automatic data processing was to find a way to store information that could be processed automatically. So we needed a standardized and automated way to store yeah, whatever information we wanted to provide to an automatic process. And the first invention related to this are so-called punch cards. So we see a picture of a punch card here on our slide. So this is just a piece of, well, a bit stronger cardboard-like paper. And in this paper, you could punch holes. So this piece of paper was put through an electric or later even an optic reader, which could detect whether there was a hole in a certain position or not. And if there was a hole, it assumed a binary one. And if there is no hole in a certain position, it assumed a binary zero. And those were invented quite early, already in 1725. And those were used first to control devices which were weaving uh, fabrics, so weaving looms invented by uh, Jacquard. And weaving looms had the property that you wanted to weave patterns in your fabric, so you had to do lots of repeated stuff to do the patterns and so on. And instead of doing it by hand, having the machine actually doing it by performing certain options of our loom, depending on if there was a hole in our punched card or not, made life quite a bit easier for the operators of the looms. Those cards were also used already in the 19th century for uh, some sort of automated data processing. So Hermann Hollerit used them for the 1890 US census and uh, also for later ones. And Hollerit's company and two other companies uh, merged later on to form IBM. And those were in use for quite a long time. So they were used until the 1970s and they were very versatile because they were just a piece of paper. They were cheap, they were easy to use. But of course, as you can see, there is not a lot of information you can store on one of these punched cards. So how did it all start? I 
dug a bit deeper and found some information about the first computers in Norway instead of what textbooks usually have, like the first American computers. So the first Norwegian computer was uh, actually developed at the University of Oslo and it was called Nusse, Norsk Universell Siffermaschine Selvstyrt Elektronisk. I hope my Norwegian is not too horrible. And this was developed by uh, Thomas Hüssing, Ulla Amble and uh, Tur Ergen at the Central Institute for Industrial Forstning. So uh, it took them five years to build this machine. So it was constructed somewhere between 1950 and 1955. And it already used electronic components, so-called so vacuum tubes, uh, which you might still know if you play the electric guitar, because very many of the very good guitar uh, amplifiers are still using vacuum tubes uh, for sound quality. Uh, so here they were not used as amplifiers, but as digital elements, and this machine had about 1000 vacuum tubes. And this machine had very little hardware to speak about. So it only had about two kilobytes of main memory, and it had a clock cycle time of uh, 0.024 milliseconds, which means it ran at about 40 kilohertz. So compare this to your modern computer, which runs at three or four gigahertz, so this is a yeah more than 25,000 times faster than this old machine. So this machine could only uh, operate uh, on about 100 arithmetic operations per second. And if you want to take a look at that machine, this was preserved and it's now exhibited at the Norsk Teknisk Museum in Oslo. And uh, this is quite an interesting machine uh, because it was the first development of computers in Norway. So how did computing start at NTNU? Well, back then it was still NTH before all the mergers that formed NTNU. And the first computer at NTNU actually wasn't a Norwegian one, but it was one developed in Denmark in the early 1960s and it came to NTH in 1962. And it was called the GIR, Geodetisk Institutes Elektroniske Reinemaschine. This was already using transistors compared to vacuum tubes of the Nusse machine. And this was a very successful machine. So it was, for example, sold to uh, German universities and even to Australian universities. So there were about 40 of these machines built. And if I read the history correctly, and you actually got two over the run of time. We even have documentation on the gear in the museum. I think the original machine was unfortunately scrapped some years ago, accidentally, which is a shame. So this machine already had a bit more memory. It had 1024 words of 42 bit main memory, which is still about five kilobytes. And it was a bit faster. So it did a fixed point addition in 49 microseconds. It could multiply two fixed point numbers in 180 microseconds. And floating point addition was a bit slower. It took uh, 93 microseconds, whereas multiplication, uh, yeah, surprisingly was a bit faster. So it only took about 170 microseconds. And this machine had some interesting additions. So it had a magnetic storage medium, so a magnetic drum, which had 960 tracks of data, and each track could store about 40 words of this 42-bit wide words. So this comes out about to 200 kilobytes of storage. But the interesting thing is that this machine was quite a bit more advanced on the software side. It already, already provided an operating system, a compiler for high-level language, Algol 60, and even a runtime library that provided virtual memory management. We're going to talk about operating systems and memory management in detail later. What's also interesting is you can uh, download a simulator for the gear machine. So you can actually run, for example, the Algol 60 compiler in a simulation of that ancient machine. And there's also an interesting video available on YouTube describing the history of computing at NTNU. So, these very first computers had very little hardware. So essentially you needed to make sure that you could use this hardware as efficiently as possible, which meant is it should concentrate on computing. Let's see if this works out. So the first computers used serial processing. Serial processing means computing was non-interactive. So you wrote your program on a piece of paper punched it into those punched cards you've seen before by hand or using a typewriter-like device. And then you handed in this set of punched cards to an operator. This operator had a list of jobs that had to be submitted to the machine. 
and just put these card sets into the card reader one after the other, let the machine operate on this, and the output was usually printed or punched to some other punched cards. So programming back then was usually performed machine language. You didn't have a high level language compiler. Your input was via punched cards that you punched offline on a separate device and that were read using a card reader into your computer. Your output was usually via printer because you wanted to read your output, but you could also do output on punched cards. And if some error showed up during the operation of your computer, for example, you try to divide by zero or you try to access an invalid memory uh, address, then some lamp lit up on the console of your computer so the operator could figure out something was wrong. He'd canceled the job and he'd probably send you a note like, oh, there's a problem, just check it and resubmit tomorrow or something. So compute time was scarce because computers were very slow, but problems to be computed on were already rather complex. So usually you scheduled your compute time using a paper counter, so the operator had a counter and some, uh, well, institutes of a university, for example, had to share one machine because computers were very expensive back then. So essentially, uh, when you bought a machine, you only got a share of the compute time and others who also paid money for that machine got maybe a bigger or smaller share of that machine. So uh, when you have like two hours of compute time allocated per week, you need to ensure that this compute time was used efficiently because you'd have to wait another week for your window of compute time to open up again. So you should try to wait, uh, avoid the waste of compute time due to an over allocation, like you have two hours per week, but you only use it for one hour, so the other hour might be unused. Or you should avoid to terminate programs due to errors because then you just waste your time because you have to recompute that stuff in the following week. Uh, back then, obviously, people really took care of these problems. So usually you wrote your program on a piece of paper and you checked it by hand in your head to figure out what was maybe problematic with your program and you corrected it before you started punching cards. And still, of course, uh, there were lots of errors that slipped through, so this was very inefficient. CPU utilization as a consequence was minimal because most of the time the computer was actually busy waiting for very slow I.O. devices like punched card readers or printers. But still back then, first system software was developed because people didn't want to write all the code for the computer from scratch. So they didn't want to write code to control your printer or code to, for example, uh, read cards from the card reader or code to calculate a sign because this code could be identical for all the applications running on that machine. So the first system software that evolved from that early machines were uh, reusable program libraries. And these included linkers and loaders to tie parts of your programs together, even debuggers and very important device drivers. So you only had to write your driver once. So not every programmer had to be concerned with writing his or her own printer driver. And of course, uh, lots of mathematical libraries to calculate complex functions and so on. Having an operator run the jobs on a machine was very inefficient because the operator's job was mostly getting new sets of punched cards from a storage area and then putting them into the computer pressing some buttons, watching the computer run that program, watching the computer print some stuff, and then do it all over again. So uh, around 1955, the idea came up to automate some of that stuff. So this was done to reduce the frequency of operator interactions because machines got more complex, the operator had different duties. And so this very manual task of really putting in jobs, waiting for them to complete, putting the printed output somewhere and then doing it all over again, well, that could be easily automated. So the first operating systems that evolved were so-called resident monitors. So they were very simple pieces of software that actually made use of the fact that you could not only encode programs and data on these punch cards, but you could also have special control punch cards that actually gave instructions to these resident monitors. So while earlier a set of punch cards just contained your program source code, 
that could be compiled at whatever, or your program machine code directly, uh, you now could introduce so-called control cards here into your stack of punch cards. So you could have a control card that indicates, okay, here's a new job with a description, for example, who is the owner of that job and uh, how much compute time should be allocated to that job before it would be automatically terminated because you maybe have accidentally programmed an automatic loop. Then there's your source code, maybe written in a high level language like Fortran, which got automatically compiled by the machine. Then there was another control card that instructed the resident monitor to actually load the program that was just compiled. And then your program usually operated on some set of input data. So this input data was contained in cards uh, marked with run. And then finally, you indicated to your resident monitor that all of your job ends with an end card. So that made it easier to automate stuff because now software running permanently on the computer took care of reading job cards, load cards, and end cards, and accordingly scheduling the job. So it interpreted these job control commands that were part of your punched cards, it loaded and executed programs from punched cards, and it could also do device control. So these simple so-called batch systems had already some sort of very primitive operating system functionality. And this part of the operating system or this simple operating system called the monitor stayed resident in memory. So it was always in memory. It didn't have to be loaded from scratch every time you had a new job. And its task was mostly to execute one application after the other. So on the right hand side, you see, we now have a view of our computer's main memory and not all of the main memory is reserved for the user program, it's only a part. And the rest of the memory is reserved for three parts of our monitor. So the first part is common device drivers. So the monitor provided a card reader device driver and a printer device driver that user programs could use by just calling functions in the device drivers. It had sequential job control. So it could start a job, it could run a job, it could end a job and output stuff. And to do this, it had some very simple command language interpreter, which was able to read commands from these job and run cards that you provided as part of your set of punched cards to execute your job. Now, there were still problems in this approach due to erroneous applications. So for example, if a program didn't terminate, well, your monitor never gained back control, so your computer actually was unresponsive, so the operator had to interfere, stop that program, maybe reload the monitor, whatever, uh, which is obviously pretty inconvenient, especially if the operator was out drinking a cup of coffee and only noticed it half an hour later that some program was running in an endless loop and didn't terminate. Sometimes programs had errors that caused them to write in the memory of the resident monitor, so messing up code or data the monitor itself used, so the monitor would crash as a consequence. Or the user program could try to access the card reader directly instead of using monitor functions and interpret control commands as data, which of course led to a crash or an incorrect result. So essentially this approach of providing some common piece of operating system software was flawed because we could not protect the operation of the operating system itself from whatever our user program was doing. So if our user program was doing something incorrectly, either due to a bug or even due to malicious students trying to figure out if the operator was responsive enough, stuff like that happened, well, your computer could crash and that was not an ideal situation, obviously. So very soon, some additional measures were introduced to ensure that the operating system stayed in control of the computer all the time. So whenever an, a user program was doing something which was incorrect, uh, this could be noticed. The operating system re, uh, retained control over your system and could stop the user program or restart it or whatever. And this was done by the addition of very simple hardware. So the first piece that was introduced is a so-called timer interrupt. So this timer is a simple piece of hardware that is driven by a, a basic frequency. And where, whenever it counts down to zero, it generates a so-called hardware interrupt. We'll see a lot about interrupts later. So this interrupt essentially 
well, as the name says, interrupted all the operations that happened on the computer at that moment. So for example, if you were running in an endless loop in your user program accidentally, this was interrupted, and then the computer automatically jumped to a predefined location, which was a part of your operating system of your monitor. And this part of the operating system, after it gained control, could check what was wrong and maybe try to fix it or just cancel the user program that was doing something that was unexpected. So that was the one problem. User programs running in endless loops or longer than expected. This could be solved by introducing the timer that interrupted user programs to check if stuff was correct. The other problem was that user programs still could try to write into any of the memory locations of the operating system. And this can be avoided by introducing a very simple hardware register, the so-called fence register over here. So this fence register simply contains an address and this address marks the split of memory between the operating system. In our example, it's sitting in the lower area of memory, starting from address zero to address hexadecimal 2FF and all the rest of the memory is reserved for the user program. So it starts at uh, hexadecimal 300 and maybe extends to the amount of memory we have in our machine. So this fence register is a very primitive approach to uh, realize memory protection. So whenever a user program was executed and it tried to access an address that was lower than what was indicated in our fence register, well, uh, our hardware actually switched execution to a function in inside of our monitor and well, accordingly, the user program could be terminated because it did something wrong. Now, in order to do this, we need to have different modes in the machine because obviously our monitor software should be able to access all, soft, uh, all memory in our system because it needs to run programs, it needs to figure out what's wrong with the user program and so on. Whereas a user program is not allowed to access memory that is reserved for the monitor. So, what was introduced is a so-called privileged operating mode of the CPU, often also called supervisor mode. So if your CPU of your computer was executed in this, uh, executing in this privileged operating mode, the fence register functionality was deactivated because otherwise it would crash when accessing its own memory. It would also allow input and output. Whereas whenever you executed code running in the user program, you switched out of this privileged operating mode to so called user mode, and the user program then was constrained to whatever our fence register allowed our program to access. So, usually, accessing IO devices was also, also constrained to running in supervisor mode, so only the device drivers here running in supervisor mode were able to do input and output. So, a user program wanting to do input and output had to call a function inside of the operating system in order to do this. So a big problem of these computer systems still was that input and output was very slow. So the CPU even back then was quite a bit faster than the card reader or the printer attached to these machines. So valuable compute time was wasted by what we call active waiting. So the computer CPU actually waiting until our cards were read, which could take a minute or so, or until our printout was done, which could take another couple of minutes. So the first solution introduced to solve this problem was offline processing. And this was enabled by an invention, which uh, you've probably seen in old film films, a uh, magnetic tape drive. So a magnetic tape drive just uses a strip of plastic which is coated with a magnetic sensitive material, essentially rust. And uh, you could store information on this by magnetizing these particles in one or the other direction to indicate a one or a zero. Essentially we did this by, by using different frequencies. And uh, now you could actually build specialized computer like shown in the picture here that consisted of a card reader, a bit of computing, and a tape drive. So whenever you prepared your set of cards, uh, what you did is you put your set of cards not directly into the main computer, but into the so-called satellite computer. And the satellite computer read them from the card reader and saved all this data on a tape from the tape drive. 
And then whenever there was time for your job to be executed, an operator came, took a tape from your uh, storage, and then put your tape where your card information was written upon into your computer. And then finally, when your computer generated output, it was generated on output tape. And this output tape was then carried by the operator to another specialized computer, which contained another tape drive and a printer to print your output. So essentially the slow task of reading cards and uh, reading them into main memory or outputting data to a slow printer was outsourced to, well, machines that were not that intelligent, which were very primitive computers, but they took the load off your main computer. So if you now have multiple users who want to use that system at the same time, you could actually reduce the overhead of IO time by providing more satellite computers because they only provided tapes. And then if you had enough tapes available, these tapes could be put one into uh, after the other into your main computer, processed and output could be written. Tapes are much, much faster than cards. So that's why this system actually works and made your CPU very more efficient to use. So this is from the 1950s. This is an example from uh, Tannenbaum's book. And if you look up these model numbers here, they're not just uh, made up. They're real model numbers of IBM machines. So the 1401 was a satellite computer system with card readers and tapes or card readers and printers. Whereas the 1794 was a machine operating on multiple tapes to provide maximum throughput. So are there other ways to solve this problem? Now, still our problem is that the CPU is faster than our card reader and printer. So we waste well-built compute time by active waiting. We've seen the first solution by using tapes and satellite computers, but that made computing very much expensive. The second solution to solve this problem is called spooling. So this is enabled by another invention. So magnetic storage evolved. And so we didn't only have tape drives, but we had disk drives in more recent computers. And these magnetic disk drives had a big advantage. So when you read a tape, you have to read the bits one after the other until you figure out which location your bits are located on and can finally read the information you're interested in. In a magnetic disk, you have random access. So you can tell the disk, please go to block 592 and read my data directly instead of reading all the other 500 something blocks in before. And you have direct memory access. So operating a disk drive usually didn't take up CPU time because data from your disk drive was written automatically to main memory and your CPU was just notified whenever an IO operation was completed. So now computation and IO could overlap on a single machine so whenever a card reader had new data to provide, this was input to the disk. And then whenever the computer had time to execute the job from the card reader, it could actually take this job, write back the results and the result data could then be printed whenever there was time for this. So computation and input output could now finally overlap, but now we had to figure out when actually a job could use a CPU. So here we need another piece of operating system functionality. So the monitor software running on that CPU now required rules for allocating the processor between different tasks that, for example, executed an IO operation in between. So they had to wait. So the CPU could take another task from disk, execute that one and so on and so forth. So the idea was here to implement efficient job management due to spooling, but still a single program does not utilize the CPU efficiently. So what was introduced about 10 years later from 1965 was so-called multi-programming. So in a spooling system, the system operation alternates between so-called CPU bursts where you do lots of calculations and so-called I.O. bursts where you do lots of I.O., but the CPU has to wait for the I.O. to complete. With multi-programming, the CPU can now work on multiple jobs at the same time while the I.O. is operating in the background. So for example, in a single program operation, 
you have the CPU doing some calculations until it needs some data from your input output device. Then it takes some time to do your I.O. And finally, when this I.O. is done, you can go back doing your calculations and maybe you do some other I.O. So you see your CPU is active for less than half of the overall running time of your system. And this is obviously a waste of compute time. So when you introduce multi-programming, you can actually run a different program when one other program is doing I.O. So you start up with program A doing some calculations deciding it needs to do some I.O. So your monitor program or operating system starts the I.O. operation, but then it doesn't want to let the CPU time go to waste. So it starts a different job on the CPU, which maybe then also decides to do I.O. Well, both I.O. operations take a bit longer. So then the CPU might still be idle for a bit, but then when the first I.O. is finished, the second one is still running here, the first process or program can get back the CPU, can do some more calculations and I.O. And then the second uh, program can take over here, do I.O. And when we take a view at the joint allocation of your computer, you see that we can spend much more time on computing and we waste less time due to I.O. So this multi-programming was introduced in 1965, but still it required to, uh, you to submit your jobs manually, maybe on a tape, or maybe uh, on punched cards, so it was still very tedious to use. But what we see here is that in order to enable multi-programming, the operating system has to become increasingly more complex. So now we have different I.O. activities running at the same time. The operating system has to manage the main memory for multiple programs running more or less at the same time and not one after the other, even if we have to switch between these programs. It has to do this internal management of the programs in execution, which we call processes. So it has to schedule the processor between these different processes now, because we're not running one program until its completion and then starting up another, but we have several programs in execution now. And finally, these several programs, A and B, can belong to different users. So we have to enable multi-user operation. So essentially we have to take care of security. So we need to enable the uh, functionality that one process is not allowed to read or write memory of the other process, for example. And for early computers, which were expensive, we also had to do accounting, which means every second of compute time costs a lot of money. And essentially you had to figure out who of the users actually used up which amount of compute time and they got a bill at the end of the months. This accounting is reintroduced nowadays in cloud systems, of course. And if you forget to shut down like a big job at uh, the Amazon uh, cluster systems or cloud systems, well, you can rack up quite a bit of uh, an invoice for compute time you never used. So you have to be careful about this still today. So this multi-programming required a bit of more complex operating system. And this in turn required that our hardware provided a bit more functionality to enable this protection. So what we need now is memory management. In the earlier system, we only had the split between monitor or operating system and our one application program. And when this one application program was finished, it was kicked out of memory, a new one was loaded, but essentially we didn't have to share the remaining memory, which was not used by the memory, uh, by the monitor between two different programs. Uh, now we have to share it between a number of different programs. So we have to do something called memory management. So essentially a program that is to be started needs an assigned memory range. It has be, to be big enough to enable yeah, its correct execution, and it needs to be small enough to enable other programs to run at the machine on the machine at the same time. And now you have to ensure not only that program A cannot write into the memory belonging to the operating system, but also that program A cannot write into program B's address space and optimally also not read from it. And of course, the other way around, program B should not be able to access program A's data and code. So the first approach of memory protection was introduced. The simple fence register we've seen before is no longer sufficient to isolate processes from each other. So the solution was to introduce a very simple hardware component called a memory management unit. This was a very simple version of it. Uh, this gets more complex in uh, future systems, obviously. So now we have to do process management. 
early on our process management just consisted of reading a program from whatever storage medium you had, executing it, writing the output, throwing it out of your mem main memory and then reading the next one. Now we had several programs in main memory at the same time. So every program in execution has its own context. So we need to know the values of its fence registers that are allocated, which now have a low and a high value. So our program A is constrained to this memory area, whereas our program B is constrained to that memory me uh, area. So this is reflected in our fence registers for program A and B. And we also need to know, because our program has to be interrupted and we have to share the execution of on the CPU between different programs, we have to know where our program was executed. So this is indicated by the instruction pointer, which is stored for the program that's currently not executing. And we also introduce something called a stack pointer because we need to figure out where context related information for program A and B is stored whenever it's not executed. So whenever uh, our operating system switches context to program A, it needs to load the hardware specific registers, low, high, instruction pointer and stack pointer with the values belonging to program A. And then when program A decides to, for example, uh, do IO, then the operating system can switch to program B. So it has to load these specific registers with the values belonging to program B and the other way around. So this context switching is an important task of the operating system. And as this context got more complicated over the years, this is one of the things that is very hard to get correct when you first start writing an operating system. So of course, computers still developed further on. So back then these systems were still using offline process. And you wrote your program by hand, you inputted it, and you got your output sometime later. Now, this is still very tedious, and from the 1970s, computers got fast enough and had enough memory to actually be shared interactively by multiple users. This was enabled by new I.O. devices, like keyboards and keyboards with printers, as you see in the upper photo, or keyboards and screens called terminals in the lower photos, and of course later also having a mouse using graphical user interfaces. So, whereas previously you only switched operation between different programs. Now we switched operations between different programs belonging to different users and this is called time sharing. So the time your CPU can uh, allocate to, uh, to computing things is now shared between different users and the trick behind this is that your CPU time, because you only have one CPU and multiple users, your CPU is switched fast enough between different users that you have acceptable so-called response times for these interactive users who sit in front of your screen, type something and want a response as soon as possible. So you start to switch your CPU between different tasks several dozens or hundred times a second now. So your relatively slow human IO devices, so your fingers uh, and, and your eyes actually think, oh yeah, you're using the computer all for yourself, even if you can't use the whole compute capability of your computer because it's shared among multiple users. We've already seen timer interrupts before to stop processes that run in an endless loop. Now these timer interrupts are extended to ensure the preemption of processes. So for example, if you had a long running process, uh, you just had a timer interrupt set for every 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds the operating system was called and now the operating system could decide, oh yeah, are there other processes? that also want to run, so I'll switch between them. And you just needed to take care to switch back to the original program process fast enough to enable that first interactive user to have the feeling of, oh yeah, I'm using the computer all for myself. So this worked pretty well if your computer had enough compute capability. Of course, if you had too many interactive users using the computer, it still got slower and slower. So this was in times before personal computers, so you still had one big shared machine and your computer rooms at the university, so the pictures there are from Columbia University, usually had dozens or hundreds of terminals where students shared one single machine. Now, if you have interactive use of computers, your approach to programming changes because you can now 
do a sort of trial and error approach, which you're probably used to. So you can enter some program using an interactive editor. So you can directly write a file to disk instead of punching it on a set of punch cards. And so you need uh, different tools or new tools to enable this interactive software development. So you now have an editor allowing you to enter and change text files. You have a command interpreter, what we had before with our punch card jobs. Now you can execute commands using your keyboard directly. This is the shell, and we see the shell later on in our Unix systems. And now we have tools we had before, like compilers, which you can now call interactively to generate machine code that you can execute. And now you have interactive debuggers, so you can run a program and you can watch what the program is doing while it's executing, so you don't have to wait for an error message or an incorrect output before trying to figure out what's wrong. You can do it interactively. And this changes the approach to doing software development. You can try out things, you can try to explore your computer, and this made computing much more approachable to, yeah, normal people, I'd say, instead of people having to use it for their job. And uh, also hardware was required to actually allow this. So you not only had disks now, but on these disks you had file systems. So you could store your data in things you could identify and find later. So files that you could name. These files had to be protected. So for example, if you hand in solutions to exercises, the other students shouldn't be allowed to read your solution. And it also allows to access programs and data at any time. So using these disks at your computers, even if these disks were very slow compared to modern SSDs, enabled this dialog computing approach, which led to our interactive computer use. We're used to today where you have dozens or hundreds of programs open at the same time. So 100 tabs in your web browser, maybe each of them executing JavaScript code, uh, your mail client, your chat client, your MP3 player running in the background. This is all enabled by this basic technology, which was started around 1970. And 1970 was also around the time the first Unix systems were developed. And those were interactively used systems more or less from the start. We'll talk a bit about the history of Unix later in the course, how it evolved from, ah, uh, we have some spare time and we found an old computer somewhere in the basement, so let's write a nice graphical game, to, oh yeah, well, we have probably the most widely shared operating system of the 1970s and 1980s, uh, which is still, of course, in use today and famous today. Uh, which evolved from these humble beginnings. All right, so what are we going to talk about during the rest of the semester? So first, we'll start off with a review of relevant computer architecture concepts. We've seen an operating system interacts directly with the hardware, it abstracts functionality of the hardware. So even if you've taken a computer architecture course before, this should serve as a refresher of a bit of the background on computer architecture we are basing on. Then of course we need to figure out what are today's challenges and tasks of operating systems. You've seen some of those in this lecture today. We'll talk about control flow abstractions. So where is your processor actually executing code? We've seen processes already. We uh, can also split up processes in different parallel uh, running tasks, so-called threads. We'll talk then about con concurrency, so different processes maybe want to access identical resources. So we have to handle to find the correct order to do this by using methods for mutual exclusion or synchronization if processes want to work together. And we'll also discuss problems showing up there called deadlocks. Memory management, we've already seen a primitive version of this. This is much more evolved today. So we'll talk about memory management and virtual memory. We'll talk about processor time allocation using a scheduler, first for uniprocessors, then also for multiprocessors. And we'll also take a quick look at real-time systems, which are used for embedded control, where the time for generating a result is very important. Uh, we'll also talk, of course, about I.O. management and especially scheduling of disk and other I.O. operations. And based on top of disks, we'll talk about file management and file systems. And then we'll uh, shortly discuss some more recent and important developments enabling today's computer infrastructure. These are virtual machines and microkernels. So virtual machines are used at all the big cloud hosters to enable sharing one physical server between different customers. This enables cloud computing, of course, and for the cloud, different approaches to operating systems were developed like unikernels, 
that got rid of most of the operating system functionality by again linking the application with a very specialized subset of a kernel. Uh, you also have so-called single address space operating systems which uh, yeah, take a different approach to virtual memory. We'll take a quick look at what operating systems for embedded systems should look like and what the special non-functional properties of these operating systems for these embedded uh, systems should provide. And finally, a very important topic, obviously, we'll take a first look at operating system security. This cannot be a complete introduction to security, obviously, so we'll take a look at common challenges and common problems related to security and operating systems. So here are some references uh, for you to look up. These are mostly historical. So the first one is uh, looking at the history of computing at uh, NTNU which was a paper published at a workshop like almost 20 years ago. The second one is a web page for the Nüsse computer at the Nostrad Technische Museum. The third one is a nice paper for, about the first computer at NTNU, the Gear computer, uh, which was published in a German book, but this article is in English, so it should be easy to read. Uh, the fourth one is a bit of a history by a person who still lived the times of having the first computer to work with. Uh, so about the first yeah, collective PC, as it's called here, the gear at NTNU. And there's a link to the simulator for the gear machine here. And there's also a nice video about the first 50 years of computing, digital computing at NTNU, available on YouTube. I hope you found this interesting. In the upcoming lecture, we'll dig a bit into yeah, an overview of computer architecture concepts uh, important to operating systems. And then we'll start digging into process management later on. Thanks for listening today and until next time.